Good morning. <sighs> so I've seen and, and given an awful lot of talks about the, fewer, uh, the future of education. And things like interactivity and project-based learning uh, come up. And the speaker then, in order to describe these great ways of teaching, they put up a PowerPoint and they lecture. <laughs> and, uh, and I always ask them, like, why aren't you using the methods that you say are so compelling in education? And they kind of shrug and go, well, that's really hard and expensive. Um, so this is, this is a better way to, to do it for now. Um, and in that spirit, I'm going to keep my comments brief uh, and focus on, on Q&A. Um, over the past decade, we've seen an enormous investment in education uh, technology, and that's a good thing. Other industries spend 10 or 20 percent on research and development. If you look around CES, uh, you can see a lot of evidence of that. Uh, even with this new investment, we spend well under 1 percent on R&D in education, and it's not a surprise uh, that we see so little change. The question uh, that was put to me is, where is this R&D uh, taking us? And first off, I should note that it's not taking us to one place. Education is not a monolith. Uh, not only is pre-K different from college and the solutions uh, are different, therefore, uh, but four-year elite colleges, the colleges you guys went to, have a completely separate set of challenges and opportunities from uh, uh, vocational schools, community colleges, and, and even just uh, uh, non-flagship state schools. That said, it's pretty clear where the world is heading, and looking at that destination is a pretty good way to judge the different companies you see uh, here uh, and, uh, and the different initiatives you, you, uh, you'll hear about over the next, over the next couple of years. So a couple of them. Um, number one is content. Um, as noted, the world is moving towards project-based learning, towards interactivity uh, increasingly. And the best way to see that right now is probably a, uh, a nonprofit called New Classrooms. It started as School of One. It's a K-12 play. Um, but it's fascinating to see how they've put together something that is uh, highly molded to the individual student, uh, highly interactive. Um, uh, there's a lot of computing going on, but not in the face of the students. Um, second is, is when, when you think about the, the content creation in higher ed, there's a tendency to think, well, we need to set a curriculum for professors. That, that, that's one option, and the, the for-profits have used that model, and, and, and some state schools, uh, there is a curriculum provider. They plunk it down. Professors sort of become TAs. The other model is that professors are going to kind of make it up as they go, and therefore there's no way to, to create high-quality asynchronous content, high-quality courses that sort of scale. And it's, it's really silly. Uh, uh, the faculties and the universities I've worked with are really excited about building really terrific asynchronous materials to flank their classroom instruction. Um, it's the schools that give them the budget to do so the physical tools to do so, and, and the uh, uh, people support. It's one thing to learn how to use Amazon. Uh, you don't need a manual. It's another thing to learn how to use uh, uh, HTML5. And we're asking professors, we give them a budget of $3,000, we give them PowerPoint, and we say, go, go create some good stuff online, and are stunned that, that they're not excited about it. Um, so I think, I think what you're going to start seeing are budgets from universities that are appropriate and tools that are kind of bubbling through that are appropriate, uh, uh, flanked with instructional designers uh, that, start, that start speeding the adoption of uh, flipped models that make sense. Um, in terms of uh, another big trend is community. And a lot of people see higher ed, and a lot of reformers bizarrely see education as a broadcast model. And it clearly isn't. Any good education uh, is not. Um, when you look at Gallup and their analysis of what kinds of experiences in college translate into better lives, not just like making more money, but better satisfaction with community, uh, with yourself, and with your job, uh, your relationship with professors and, and back in K-12, uh, there's lots of studies, your relationship with teachers uh, matters a great deal. And uh, how that translates online, 
how we create communities where students are working with each other and not simply locked into uh, 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 a computer, I think is, uh, is, is, is a trend you'll see. Uh, there's some false starts where we think we can replace uh, those kinds of relationships with, uh, uh, with computers we can't, and, and you'll see a tendency, uh, a trend back the other way. Um, just to note, in K-12, let's say that we have a 20 to 1 student-faculty ratio, which is a pretty good ratio. And let's say for a minute that teachers make $70,000 a year, right? That translates into about, uh, let me get this right, about $3,500 per student per year to teach. So the average school is spending eight to $10,000 at this point. In New York, we're spending $20,000 per student per year. Um, we can have really fine student-teacher ratios and not break the budget. Similarly, in college, if you've got uh, classes of 25 and professors who are teaching Let's just say for a minute, not a research uh, faculty, but, uh, but non-tenure track faculty, teaching, let's say, eight or nine courses a year, three semesters, three courses each, of 25 students, so that in effect they're getting to about 200 students during the year. A professor making $120,000 a year is costing under $600 per course per student. And again, you know, put that in context, uh, universities are charging up to $5,000 for that course. Um, $600 is actually the cost of a good professor who's perfectly well paid and who is teaching relatively small classes. We don't have to get rid of the human element to make education affordable. Um, at the same time, you'll see a big trend towards adaptivity. And adaptivity has been talked about for a long time. There's no uh, IP here, um, uh, but clearly the asynchronous part of any instruction should mold itself to you, and this isn't rocket science. Um, the question is how do you have the adaptive kind of model where students are learning different things at different times, and similarly, how do you have uh, a, a competency-based model while still having a sense of community, while I'm still working with other students on an ongoing basis and building relationships, working with faculty, but not all learning the same thing at the same time. In terms of physical spaces, people are thinking that the classroom of the future is very high tech. In fact, it's incredibly low tech. If you go to the D school at Stanford, you know, basically it's a big room with a bunch of movable walls. And, uh, and it's the students who bring the tech uh, in the form of laptops or mobile devices. Um, the spaces themselves are just a place to convene. Uh, I don't think I don't think that the physical space is important other than we need to convene, uh, whether it's online or not. Um, people, by the way, mock the climbing walls at colleges and all, all sorts of uh, things, uh, just like they mock uh, offices in great companies that have you know, pool tables or, or, or whatever. In fact, those are critical parts to building community and, uh, and, and part of just spaces that work, spaces that have maximize the, uh, the, the number of random collisions. I think you're going to see education be much more just in time. In programming, we've moved from a waterfall model to an agile model, and I think education is doing the same thing. There are fewer and fewer things where you have to learn everything at once and then go do it for the rest of your life. Students today are going to have 27 jobs, according to the Department of Labor, and you'll see things more like General Assembly, three to six months, uh, uh, five to fifteen thousand dollars as you switch jobs, as you switch careers. I don't think that that's going to break down the fundamental K-16 experience. I think best, the best colleges are doing something that is pretty deep and the socialization aspect is pretty important. Um, but once you get to that point, everything else is, is going to be much more agile. And finally, um, you're going to see education that is more flexible and less accountable. And again, in terms of false starts in the same kind of realm as the people who believe we don't need teachers or the people who believe that one size fits all. Common Core uh, 
uh, the notion that every college should be judged by the same metric of first year uh, 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 income, those are dead ends. And, uh, and you'll see them disappear. I think Common Core is like the last of a 30 year effort to gain accountability um, in the wrong way. We need accountability. We need to know what works in education and what doesn't. But we can't sacrifice the flexibility of saying that anybody with two kids knows that kids walk in with different needs and with different interests and, uh, and should be taught differently. Not just the same thing taught in different ways, but actually want to learn different things. Um, and, uh, and, and, and the way you're starting to see that in colleges is really where accreditation started. And so you could imagine uh, that the accreditation process is going to change, you know, kind of commensurate with this, which is tell us what you're trying to do for which kids. What's the point here? And then show me hard evidence that you're doing it. And in a big data world, we have the ability to do that in a much more sophisticated way. The ability to force people to tell us what they're doing and force people to measure it uh, in terms of long-term longitudinal data that, uh, that I think will introduce a, a notion of transparency and choice that doesn't exist right now. Um, it is hard, by the way. I'm not saying any of this is trivial, but every other profession, every other industry has already done it. This is totally doable and, uh, and, and necessary. Um, the, uh, the final trend, by the way, is, is neuroscience-based. Uh, um, we're, we're teaching, you know, there are little studies here and there, but the fact is that we know almost nothing about how the brain works. And as we are starting to learn, um, I think it's going to dramatically change the practice of teaching. At MIT right now, there are professors who swear to me that they can run an MRI on a one-year-old and say, this kid is going to be dyslexic. And so imagine if you could do that inexpensively and unobtrusively and start teaching somebody from day one in a way that's going to, that's going to work rather than wait till third grade when he hates school and, uh, and try to catch him up uh, now that we've figured out that there's, uh, that there's a problem. In the same way, there's a growing data that the first 200 days that there are certain things you have to do with kids for the first 200 days to, to evolve their brain. And it's a lot like, it's a lot like vitamins, right? You, you need a certain number of vitamins to, uh, to be healthy, and above that, it's just expensive urine. Um, it's not like the more you do with kids in their first 200 days, uh, the more you create uh, Einstein. It's that if you don't do certain things, you have a kid who's permanently disabled. And, uh, and especially in uh, less advantaged areas, uh, both in the U.S. and abroad, that is a huge issue and actually very, very easily fixed. Um, and I think the science is starting to come out and, and, uh, and the products and services are coming in behind that that are pretty exciting. I'm not sure about Lumosity. Um, I, have, I've, I have no official opinion on if it's just crap uh, or if there's something real, but the notion of companies devoted to uh, inexpensive interventions to help you think better at different points in your life is a good notion, and, and I, think, I think you'll see more of it. Um, the notion of people fighting for resources that their school is going to apply to their, disabled, uh, to their learning disabled kid, I think will give way to really inexpensive things that they can just buy online. Uh, um, the final note is, uh, what can't we give up? In all of these changes, what are the things we want to make sure dis don't disappear? And I've already said the relationship between students and faculty uh, is critical. Uh, second is the, the mission of K-16 as more than just preparation for a job. Uh, things that are measured by your lifetime happiness and, and community involvement and, uh, and, and career satisfaction uh, are, are critical. And finally uh, is cost. We have to lower the cost of college, and we can't screw up education by lowering it. Um, but I think, I think you'll see some really important things there. If you look at alt schools and a couple of other models like it, they don't cut the cost of education by destroying the teacher side. They centralize administration, streamline administration, and bring the cost of a, of a, of a private school basically uh, in half. 
Um, I think you're going to see both at higher ed and K-12 uh, major efforts to streamline administration. By the way, people think colleges have gotten way more expensive. Um, college tuition net of financial aid has been flat for 13 years. It is not actually going up. What's happened is 30 years ago, airlines discovered price segmentation. I can charge you this much for the seat. I can charge him you know, $1,000 for the seat next to you. And, uh, and they've gotten very good at it, and they advertise their least expensive seat. Colleges discovered the same thing 30 years ago, that they can price segment, that they can charge a wealthy family a lot more, and then uh, use that to discount more, more heavily to less advantaged families. Um, they advertise, though, their, least expen uh, their most expensive seat. They advertise their, their stated tuition. And it's freaking people out. College going is down three years running now, um, largely based on people's concern about costs. And so we've got to figure out how we present costs, and we've actually got to lower the cost. And again, I think uh, centralization and streamlining of administration is where that's going to happen. So in summary, and then I, I do want to uh, take questions and comments, we're at a turning point in education. Learning will become steadily more social, adaptive, flexible, science-based, ubiquitous, and compelling. And it'll become less expensive. But it's a big boat that turns very slowly, and it's highly politicized and highly inertial. Um, this is going to happen in fits and starts, and there's going to be backsliding. If you look at what's happened in the New York schools in the past uh, couple years, it's a perfect example of it. Um, these trends, though, are really powerful. I mean, you can swim against a tsunami for only so long, and, and I, think, I think you're going to see this happening uh, uh, steadily and, uh, and persuasively over the, next, uh, over the next couple decades. That said, uh, I'd love to open this up to questions and comments. I'll try not to say anything that the governor of Maine uh, would say. You're totally right. The, people, people talk a lot about the differences between for-profit and non-profit education. And, and the for-profits then get up and say, why should my tax status matter? Um, you should judge everybody the same way. The real thing is, uh, and, and where that all came from, is there's four-year liberal arts education of one sort or another, and there's vocational education. And, that's really the split, and I think it's perfectly reasonable to judge vocational education by your vocation. Do you get a job in that profession, and what do you make, and are you happy there? Whereas judging uh, four-year schools by that metric dumbs them down in exactly the way you're saying. Um, looking at the data longitudinally, though, looking at what, are your, like, what Gallup is doing with Purdue and ASU and others, um, are your kids happy over the next 20, 30 years? Are they thriving in their communities? Are they thriving at work? Are they happy with work? And there's some incredible numbers coming out um, of what kinds of things happen in college that translate into, into better lives. Um, so the fumbling around we think is probably really important, and I think it's probably really important, but it's provable one way or the other, as are lots of other things that we do at colleges right now. And we need to be a little bit patient but it's real data and not sort of made up, made up numbers. We actually have roving microphones around, so if you have a question, just raise your hand. And if you could introduce yourself too when you ask your question, we'd love to know who you are and where you're from as well. So any other questions, please? I am Marina Rodriguez. I am the CEO of Laureate Peru in, Peru in Peru. We have a system of universities and a technical degree college, two universities, one in the traditional high price and one in the middle segment and a tech book, a vocational education. And one of the things that I'm struggling with is that we are 
uh, very innovative. We are young institutions, and we have we we, were st we started our schools with a competency-based learning with a lot of technology. It's more than a comment than a question. And what I'm I'm struggling now is that the environment I'm I'm working with with my institutions is one that is going backwards. I mean, the policymakers and the accreditation bodies uh, are applying and trying to apply regulation mainly because there are some really bad players in the market, and we are for profit. Um, and their, their standards and the way they are regulating the industry is, is going backwards, so it's stifling the innovation and their capacity to introduce new learning models and technologies. So what are your comments on, on that? Well, first of all, I think the same thing has happened in the U.S. The for-profit education companies, and I've run for-profit education companies for 30 years, have soiled the well. As a group, overall, we've done probably more harm than good, like especially when you look at higher ed. And it makes it very easy for nonprofit educators to mistrust all of us. Um, the ability for our community to police itself and, and to hold itself to higher standards is, I think, critical to people trusting us to be part of the conversation and to help, in, and to help innovate. Um, I kind of feel that way about competency-based education, whether done by for-profits or non, that the notion of competency-based is so brilliant, right? Why should I have to sit in a seat if I already know this or if I can learn it faster? Uh, it makes perfect sense. I should be able to move at my own pace. The reality of it often is it turns college into test prep. Right? There's a test at the end. I'm studying for that test. As soon as I take it, I pass it, I move on. I've learned very, very little. Test prep is not, and I did test prep a long time, um, and consider myself somewhat the ghost of unintended consequences. Right? Like, like test, the test prep industry is exactly what the testing industry did not have in mind. Um, and competency-based is creating a lot of that as well. And so that, that's an initiative that has to be really transparent and really, really careful about not getting anywhere near the line of just being kind of rote memorization towards a test. Hi, my name is Adam Eastman and I'm from UC Berkeley and I've been working on a startup to integrate the flipped classroom into college campuses, specifically my own as a starting point. And uh, the biggest issue I ran into was I was a little too optimistic, and I thought everyone was like, yeah, this is a great idea. Turns out a lot of professors think that, you know, they're the bee's knees. They've been doing this forever. All their students love them, you know, send them emails saying, oh, thank you for being the hardest professor, you know. I, you know, work in this great place. So they're a little stuck in their ways. And I'm curious how you think um, we can go about getting professors to you know, oh, realize the potential here, rather than me going up and saying, hey, you know, look at all these stats about the flipped classroom and how great it is, and, and all, all the things you're mentioning about online learning and how we can incorporate it, rather than having PowerPoints and professors just you know, reading off a script. Uh, in, in my experience working with universities, you start with two or three professors who want to adopt and you do a great job with them and let them sell everybody else. Uh, if, if what you're doing is compelling, if it really works, and if they love it, and if the students love it, it'll spread. Um, there are very, very few professors I've worked with who weren't open to this, but generally they're skeptical, and generally, again, the budgets they're given to do it aren't sufficient to do it well. And so they sort of look at it and say, yeah, that, it would be a lot of work, and no one's going to give me release time, uh, 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 compensating time or money for that work. And, it's, uh, and it means learning a bunch of tools that I, I really don't have any interest in learning. I'm a psychology professor. I really love talking about psychology. I don't want to become a, an engineer. Um, so how you work with them, how you love them up, and who you find as early adopters, I think, is going to be the, the tell. Hi, uh, Paul Kelly, IBM. Over here. Oh, 
So um, there's been one common theme across CES that I've noticed that there's the difference between millennials and the older generation. Um, how do you see the changing face of the adult education market? Maybe people who want to upskill. I'm sorry, how do I see the changing face of? Adult education, so people returning to education maybe once they're in their career or um, they want to upskill and catch up with millennials and more, more coding experience. How do you see that market changing in the future? Well, one you know, kind of silly way is, is that millennials are way more comfortable learning in a mobile environment. Um, education in general, to serve them, is much more around your life instead of a separate thing from your life. And so mobile is a critical part of that. You're, you're doing it in the car, you're doing it on the plane, you're, you're wherever you are, you know, you can get 20, 30 minutes of learning in uh, versus, versus put your life on hold and, and head someplace. But second, I think, I think the real issue with adult learning, whether it's millennials or Gen X or, 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 or even boomers still, um, has to do with, with just in time. That what is it you need to learn? You're driving that, not me. And, and how quickly can I teach it to you? And, and how compelling can I make the experience? General Assembly, what I really love about them is their focus on their buildings as communities and the physical spaces you go to. And the reason it's so good is you're learning a lot, again, just by being in the space, by working with the other people, by just chatting and drinking with them. And, uh, and so it's, it's, it's the creation of an environment. It's not simply uh, 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 a forced march. Hello, I'm uh, Joe Bowen from Pickens Technical College in uh, Colorado. Um, and you uh, talked earlier about the challenge of having um, curriculum be adaptive and also uh, having a community. Have you seen any solutions that incorporate both of those elements? Again, I think new classrooms is the closest. I was skeptical it could be done at all. And, uh, and the model that they use is, is, is pretty clever uh, in doing that, but um, but I got to admit, I haven't seen anyone in higher ed pull that off persuasively. Uh, the notion of a flipped model, where we're going to meet on Tuesday as a group in a small class, you know, uh, uh, highly interactive. Between now and Tuesday, here are the things you've got to learn. That can be somewhat adaptive. And the particular thing you're learning, you might do it with the three other students who are learning that. And, and in a highly kind of scattered way, people having little experiences, and now we all come back together. And as long as it's not tracked, as long as it's not always the same three students, but this particular thing, now I'm working with these guys, but when I'm coming back, there are 20 of us or there are 10 of us in a room, and, and we're all interacting, I think you can, you can get both. The, uh, the key is, that the community stuff is probably more useful than the adaptive stuff. If I bore you a little bit by teaching you something you kind of already knew, um, you'll live. If I isolate you, you'll learn worse, you'll have a worse time. There's any number of, of, of social uh, 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 problems that come out of that and retention and everything else. Hey, John, it's allowed. Um, I have a question about the different types of learnings for the students. So do you see any differences between uh, soft skills learning versus technical skills or hard skills learnings? It's a great question. Um, anybody have an answer? <laughs> uh, It starts with measurement. Hard skills are so easy to measure, and soft skills are so hard to measure, um, that a lot of times we, we treat them differently um, for only that reason. Uh, no, I, 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 think, I think we tend to focus on hard skills because they're, 
because they're more measurable. Um, I don't think that teaching them is much different. It's a matter of intent. It's a matter of working backwards from where you want to get kids uh, or students. And uh, you look at, again, uh, General Assembly or Flatiron School or the coding boot camps in general, and they speak an awful lot about the soft skills of turning you into a person who thinks like a coder, who works with other coders, who, who knows how to become part of that community, and that's every bit as important to them uh, and every bit as, as driving their curriculum as, as the software development itself. Um, so it, it, it totally can be done. It's, it's a matter of will. Hmm. Um, I'm from Canada. We've been, uh, I've been in the education business for almost 40 years. Uh, uh, launched my own uh, R&D school 20 years ago. Uh, developed models and systems that we believe are uh, needed for the for the 21st century that we live in. Uh, the hard skill, soft skill question really boils down to uh, can we actually uh, identify the soft skills and the attributes uh, that go with those soft skills? And uh, we've been doing that for many years, starting with uh, children as young as five, all the way through where we've identified uh, what we call certain habits that students need to have. And through self-assessment, if the, if the attributes are clear enough and there is a, a, a growth indicators that we use in terms of self-assessment, students can very powerfully self-assess not only hard skills but soft skills. And uh, we have developed systems and models around that uh, and how to do that. Uh, but I do have a comment about the general uh, state of education because we, are tr we travel extensively around the world working with schools and districts and governments. And uh, one of the phenomena that we have seen is uh, some of the language around what is happening, they're using the word transformation as we have in transforming education, but the actual definition of transformation is a major change form of function. And uh, the failure of educational reform has primarily been derived trying to improve obsolescence. And most of the initiatives that I have seen globally are people doing much the same thing under the new banner of transformation. If we understand transformation, you have to understand the root of the problem is the system. And a major change of the system, a factory assembly line approach, uh, has to be transformed by new system structures. And along that, we have developed many, many structural components that allows the, the system to go into more personalized. You talk about project-based learning and flip learning, all those things are good practices, but they're not transformational. And uh, so uh, my question really is, I, I, is more of a comment uh, regarding the soft and hard skills, but the question is, do you see a, a challenge by using the word transformation, more or less doing what we've always done and trying to incrementally improve an obsolete system? I'll answer that differently for higher ed and K-12. Um, higher ed, I think you're seeing a transformation. Uh, graduate school is utterly being transformed. I think professional master's programs are going to be history uh, because they're trying to teach too much in a short chunk. I think you'll see stackable certificate programs, things that are 12 credits that look a lot more like GA than they do like a, a traditional uh, professional masters and, and a much more of a just-in-time kind of thing. And some of the providers of those things are not going to be the traditional providers. But you've always had lots of choices in higher ed of people with different approaches, different geographies, different uh, uh, goals. K-12, I couldn't agree more with you. The district structure is a major impediment to transformation. The money and effort that we're putting into dead ends like Common Core if we were putting them into structural change, um, things like the charter movement, uh, and I'm on the board of the charter group because I, I, I really believe that that is enabling transformational change in exactly the way you're saying. Uh, I think we'd be way, we'd way further ahead now already. Okay, I think we'll take one more question from you, John, if you don't mind. No. And if we could ask our panelists, who will be for the next panel, to step on back behind the screen, we can get you mic'd up so you're ready to go. And we'll take one more question. We have a young lady here. 
Thank you. Um, this is Jai here. My question is about the business model of making education a viable business or sustainable business. The current challenge for traditional education is the beneficiary themselves, K K2, K2 through higher ed, do not have the money to pay for the education. Therefore, they take loans or parents subsidize that. And then for ongoing online learning for adults, um, the general perception is information online is free. So how, what is a way out? I'll answer the second part first. Uh, the convening of a great school and the certification that that school puts on you uh, and the employability that comes with that, um, as, long as, the, as long as we can rein in the price, and I really believe one of my new initiatives, I, th I think we can lower the cost of higher ed by about 25%, just hitting at the critical things that can be streamlined and centralized versus at the teaching. Um, at a reasonable cost, there's still a plenty big market. Education's America's fifth largest service export. Um, so people are willing to pay if there's, a, if there's a clear goal and if the cost is not unreasonable. To the first uh, uh, point, um, some of the best education businesses have probably been B2C. Um, People are willing to pay, even less advantaged people are willing to pay if there's a clear, compelling uh, uh, outcome. Uh, the, the district market selling into schools and districts is ridiculously hard. Um, and the number of startups that get a false positive because they know somebody in some district and they get their first sale and everybody gets kind of excited and then they hit the real world is, is, uh, is again part of the problem. How we change how districts buy and how we change the district structure is I think gonna be a critical part of solving, especially for less advantaged families, uh, uh, the innovation problem. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you.